There we go. So welcome back to our uh, Kansas City travelers. Glad to have you guys back tonight. Trust that uh, Delcana and uh, Yale are tuning in okay and anybody else that might be joining us. Uh, Russell Richardson here from Savvy Island Community Church Servants Bible School. We are working our way through the New Testament survey. Tonight we are in the book of Acts. But we want to start in the book of Isaiah tonight, just as a little devotional thought uh, as we get started. Isaiah chapter 50. This was, uh, I think this was yesterday's reading. Yes, it was. Uh, we're going to read the whole chapter. It's all 11 verses, um, long verses. Uh, even though it's a relatively short chapter, it's 11 long verses. So, Isaiah chapter 50, 1, 50, 1 through 11. Thus says the Lord, Where is the certificate of divorce by which I have sent your mother away? Or to whom have of my creditors did I sell you? Behold, you were sold for your iniquities. And for your transgressions, your mother was sent away. Why was there no man when I came? When I called, why was there none to answer? Is my hand so short that it cannot ransom? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, I dry up the sea with my rebuke. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain a weary one with a word. The weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning and awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. For the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment." If you've been reading with us in Isaiah, you see some common themes that get repeated again and again. The Lord stretches out the heavens, uh, the Lord's servant again and again. And here, certainly this applies at least uh, in one side of things to the Lord Jesus. Um, And here's what I wrote for the day. Here's what I wrote for yesterday. Um, Jesus, in a real sense, was discipled by the Father from the standpoint of his humanity, as it were. Uh, In John chapter 5, he says, 1920, he says, I only do what I see the Father doing. The Father shows me, that's what I do. Uh, That's the essence of discipleship. You get shown how to do it, you get told how to do it, then you go do it. Uh, What you hear, you do. That's what disciples are supposed to do, learn and then do. That's how he, Jesus, was empowered able to give, he was given the tongue of disciples. I thought that was interesting that it was in a plural. Tongue of disciples. I'm not sure how that, how that applies unless it refers to the disciples' tongues that he gets from us eventually. Um, Hopefully that might be part of it. Uh, The words to sustain the weary is what he hears from the Father. That's the words that he passes on. Um, Disciples, those who follow Jesus, who are awakened each day, who listen, whose ears are open to hear his words, and then they use their tongues to speak his words. 
to sustain those who are weary. I thought, what a perfect picture of discipleship. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And we teach it by speaking the word, and we teach it by living the word, and it gets passed on. That's what the essence of discipleship is. And he throws this in here right at the end, this thing about uh, make yourself a fire. You're, you're trying to sustain, have your own light. You're rejecting the light of the servant who's trying to give you the truth. They're plucking out his beard and rejecting him, uh, and they're coming up with their own light. And uh, so he warns them about there. There's a warning here to those who reject the light of God that comes through Jesus Christ and in a sense that come through his disciples, his servants, as they come and tell that truth. And then they seek to make their own light or make up their own light, if you will. Uh, the words, the doctrine, the ideas, the teaching. Why do you believe that? Uh, in essence, they make it up uh, as opposed to getting it from the, from the truth. So if they're going to make their own light, he says, you're going to build your own fire and make your own firebrands. He says, this is what you'll get from me. Torment. In the end, it's going to be torment for you because you heard the truth. You were told the truth. You rejected that light, the true light coming into the world that lights all men. They rejected that. And if you reject that, then what's left? Darkness and tor torment. Um, so we want to be disciples. We want to have ears that listen to God's word. We want to have tongues that are used to speak his words to others that hopefully will sustain the weary. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Those words of Jesus. It's his compassion. And hopefully they will not reject that light and suffer that torment that is there in the end. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we have received that light, that there were those who taught us and there were those who lived it before us and prayed for us. Um, help us to carry on that task as disciples. May we, may we awaken each day ready to hear whatever it is you teach us, ready to learn whatever you have for us that day. Having ears that are tuned to your voice and ears that are open, ready to hear, and hearts that are ready to receive and wills that are ready to obey, that we might do, that you might receive glory, that you might have others who would turn to you, to your light, and find the light of the world. So Lord, would you give us light even tonight as we look at the book of Acts? Would you help us to see how this light began to spread? And Lord, may we be encouraged to continue that process. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a half step back. Is that better? Okay, I'll pull that back that way. Okay. Is it cutting off the top of my head? Okay. <laughs> Maybe if I get a little higher, it cuts me off at the, at the neck, and then they don't have to look at me. <laughs> uh, you should have... Quiz number three in your hands, or you'll get it or at some point at Delcana and uh, at Yale. Um, on this end, we're just sending it home and having them bring it back, but however you guys want to do it on your end is fine. We are in the book of Acts. Uh, the Acts of the Apostle, the New Covenant proclaimed is how Benoit is putting it in his uh, orderliness, in his outline. Uh, in the Gospels, we had it. Uh, instituted, we had it initiated. In fact, with Sunday we just celebrated, uh, had communion on Sunday, the Lord's Supper, remembering. And in, and in Isaiah, just as a side note, twice it told us in Isaiah last week that that God was going to make His servant Himself the covenant for the people, that He was going to be the covenant for the people. And so, how, what appropriate way for us to come to the table Sunday? And I, I was thinking, wow, that's this is about Jesus. He's the covenant. It's not just the, the ceremony that's there. So the Acts of the Apostles um, could be called the Acts of Jesus Christ. It could be called the Acts of Jesus Christ through his apostles. And I guess we could even call it the Acts of Jesus Christ through his apostles by the Holy Spirit. 
or just X. <laughs> That's how we usually refer to it. Uh, and we usually think, in fact, I think most Bibles it has the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we're going to look at what Luke in, probably intended for the, the title to be as we, as we work our way through here, uh, assuming that Luke was the author. Uh, you would think that would be a no-brainer. Um, common before we get into the issue of that the common it's a, it's common for a biography to have this form for a title in that era especially uh, the acts of hannibal the acts of what whoever uh you i think the last class where i i looked at mark and i thought the 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 hunting adventures of mark Wolbright. You know, they're, just think of those kind of things. You're going to tell a story about somebody or something, and here it's the acts of the apostles. What did the apostles do? What were the things that they did uh, trying to, you know, spread this gospel and, and bring the message to others and make more disciples? Um, in Acts 1.1, look at how it starts. Well, he talks about writing to Theophilus again, like he did in, in the first one. Uh, but he says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. The idea he began to do it, and he's going to continue to do it uh, until the day that he was taken up. Um, and that he gave orders to the apostles for them to carry on that work. He had even told them earlier, you know, you're, the works I do, you're going to do and do even more even greater because i'm going to the father the spirit's coming to you and of course they had no clue what he was talking about yet uh, but they found out um, you compare acts one with luke one you see the theophilus reference in there so this is the companion to the book of luke um, meant to go together i don't know if they got written uh back to back and sent together or luke got sent on ahead to Theophilus, and then Acts came later. Uh, not sure how that worked. Um, all, that, all that Jesus began infers continuance. It doesn't say all that Jesus began and now he's going to continue to do, but it's inferred that he's going to continue to do it, and he's going to do it through his apostles, is the way it's described here. In, uh, in verse 2, uh, Luke shows that he intends for this to, to be a, a continuation of the book, the gospel that he wrote. It's a history, or, or maybe we could use documentary, uh, although he has a lot of history stuff in here for sure. He uses the same research standard for, that he used in the gospel. Uh, he, plus, he had his travel with Paul that he could draw from. He had personal experience in this one. We, we don't know whether he ever met Jesus Christ in the flesh, as it were, uh, but we do know that he was with Paul on quite a bit of his trips, or, or quite, a, quite often, and so he's got firsthand knowledge that he can contribute now, uh, along with interviews and stories, whether he's getting it from Paul or getting it from Barnabas, or getting it from... I can imagine this, that it, when, he go, when they go back to a place where they've already been, and if Luke's there, well, tell me about the early days. You know, I've heard Paul's side of it. You tell me. And he, I could almost see him interviewing people in the churches just to get their stories, to get a feel for how those things happened. Uh, there's the, it's the continuance of the Holy Spirit's work. I don't know if you remember when we looked at Luke, Luke has much more to say other than John's, uh, Jesus is teaching that last, that last evening to the disciples. Luke mentions the Holy Spirit a lot, brings, brings in the Holy Spirit again and again. And so that's continuing on. And that's why some, you know, while well, he, he was looking, he was living it from here, looking back and seeing how, well, it worked this way here, and that's the way it worked there as well. So it was common for, it was natural for him to, attribute that to the Holy Spirit, because that's where it was from. Um, he doesn't cover all the apostles. He only covers two main ones, if we count Paul as the apostle, 
Peter and Paul. Uh, John gets mentioned, usually just as a sidekick to, uh, to Peter. Uh, James gets mentioned because he dies. <laughs> Judas gets mentioned. So Judas gets mentioned, and Matthew doesn't get mentioned, and Thomas doesn't get mentioned. None of the other guys get mentioned. Um, hmm? Neither does Andrew. No, and Andrew, Andrew was kind of a star in, in, in some of these things at times. Um, doesn't cover them all. Uh, he doesn't cover uh, all. Whoops, go back. Sorry. There we go. Um, doesn't cover all of their acts, not everything they did. Some of it's just kind of summed up and, and it's kind of highlighted and, and pick this one and not that one. Um, and there are at least two deacons that get mentioned Stephen and Philip. Not Philip the apostle, but Philip the deacon. Uh, a little confusing when you don't throw a last name in there to, to tell you who they are. Uh, here is a chart, fill that in there, comparing Luke and comparing Acts. I don't remember where I pulled this out of, but uh, I don't think it's in one. I don't have a note that it's from Benoit or, or Nelson. Um, in Luke, he begins with an address to Theophilus, as he does in the book of Acts. Uh, in Luke, there's an announcement made by the angel Gabriel. In Acts, there's an announcement made by two angels at the very beginning. What are you guys doing? Why are you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who is coming back. So there's angels involved there. Uh, they both begin in Jerusalem. Uh, in Luke, the birth of Jesus as the Spirit comes on Mary, and in Acts, the birth of the church as the Spirit comes on believers. And then there is movement toward Jerusalem in the book of Luke. Because we don't start in Jerusalem with his ministry, although we have him born uh, in Bethlehem, and then he goes to Egypt, then he goes to Galilee, and then the next time we see him in Luke, he's coming on his way. He's working his way towards Jerusalem. In the book of Acts, there is movement away from Jerusalem. It starts in Jerusalem, and then it begins to move away. The story centers uh, further and further out and away from Jerusalem. Luke, in Luke and in Acts, uh, it begins with that address to Theophilus. Uh, there's the same ascension story, not exactly in all the details, but it's the same account, uh, more detail than Acts. There's reference to his first writing in his second writing. Uh, there's characteristics in Acts that look and feel and sound like Luke. You know, it's the same style, you're, you're kind of used to it. So if you were reading Luke and Acts, you, would, you, would, you wouldn't see any change. You don't see a change in, in any of the feel of it. Luke's language is the same, uh, at least from the Greek side of things, and it is in translation as well. There's the prominent work of the Holy Spirit that we see again and again and again in both books. And again, he uses medical terms when he's talking about people with diseases and sicknesses and illnesses. Uh, he uses technical terms, I guess you would say, that would come from his training. Uh, some external evidence. That we're, we're all making a case here for Luke being the author is what we're doing. Uh, the same guy who wrote the gospel is the same guy who wrote the book of Acts. Uh, because you would think that it was a no-brainer that everybody would think that, but of course, not everybody agrees. And not everybody agreed that Luke should be even in the Bible, Luke or the book of Acts. Um, some external anti-Marcionite prologue. Uh, Marcion, we'll learn a little bit more about Marcion as we get into uh, Paul's letters. Marcion was, I don't know if he was a direct disciple of Paul or just a guy that fell in love with him later. Uh, he, he, he only wanted Paul's writings in the New Testament. He, he despised anything that smelled of Judaism. And so he didn't want anything that talked about Judaism very much, other than Galatians, I guess he was okay with, but that was because they were going away from, we aren't going to be circumcised, we aren't going to be under the law. Uh, he was very anti-Jewish. And so in his mind, Luke 
and the book of Acts, it's tainted with Judaism. It's got too much Jewishness, especially in Acts, where, they, where the church begins to say, okay, Gentiles, let's, let's work this out. Let, let's, these are the only things we're going to kind of put on you. So Marcion denied it. When the anti-Marcion group uh, put together their text and put together their assortment of writings that they were going to say are, are God's word, uh, in their prologue, they mentioned Luke. Obviously, Marcion and, and the anti-group, 1500 AD. So we're well, we're we're way down the line there. So uh, a disciple of Paul only in corruption, <laughs> a corrupted disciple. Um, when they wrote, when they put it in, they wrote a a note in the front or a prologue before that. Luke wrote this gospel, the physician Luke who traveled with Paul, something along those lines. Um, not 1500. 150 AD, sorry. Uh, the Muratorian canon included it in 160. Uh, some of that stuff you might remember from bibliology, some of the gather, how we pulled all that together. Irenaeus confirmed, he said that it was Luke. Tertullian, Tertull, Tertullian said that it was Luke. Uh, it was known as Luke's gospel and as Luke's writing in the book of Acts uh, in Rome, in Asia Minor and in Africa, across northern Africa, uh, early on. Uh, those were centers. Alexandria was a, a, a huge center for Christianity at one point, and, and there they recognized it as such. So, 63 AD is the, is the date we kind of throw there within a, a few years, a couple of years. Uh, it's going to be, obviously, right about the same time as Luke, uh, I don't know how long it would take to put these things together and get them, get them squared away. Uh, there are those who want to put it in a, a later date, uh, but if you go through and you're looking at where does, where does Acts end, it's about 63 AD, give or take. Uh, because why does it end? It just ends, and it ends kind of abruptly, you know. but it ends. Why does it end? Because Paul, Paul's in Rome. And it seems as if that may play into part of what Luke's trying to do. Uh, let everybody know how this gospel, how Christianity got to Rome and give them a flavor and a taste for, for what it really is all about. So the gospel and the book of Acts, uh, complementary, a history of Christianity that says, uh, here, this is, who, this is who the church is. Um, Part of that, the, that abrupt end is because of getting to Rome. There, there's the idea that the church was looking for religious license. That's what that word means. Uh, religio licitus, licitus, I think it is. Um, it has to do with being recognized as an official accepted religion in the Roman Empire. For a while, Christianity was just the coattails of Judaism. That was oh, this is the Jewish sect was the way that the Romans generally took took it, but after a while, you know, we're looking at 35 years down the road here, the church is making much more noise. Things are happening and things are being changed in communities and and there's riots going on in some of these places where Paul and where the where the gospel has come, and so now you've got to sit up and take notes. There's a church in Rome, and apparently a pretty strong one to some degree. And so, in essence, maybe Luke is writing to Theophilus to say, look, these are, this is a legitimate, genuine religious group here. They're not just, you know, some, they're not just attached to Judaism. They're their separate own group. And, and there were some anti-Jewish things going on. In fact, they kicked all the Jews out of Rome at one point. And so, maybe trying to draw a line, say, look, don't put us as a Jewish sect. Let us stand on our own that we're separate. The Jews have rejected us. They've not agreed to us. They haven't agreed that Jesus is the Messiah. So there's a, a separation there. Uh, so perhaps he's looking for that, helping to try to get that a, approval. Uh, there is uh, silence regarding the fall of Jerusalem. You know, again, that... It's kind of the argument by absence. 
even though John didn't mention it either. Uh, but when he, when he ends, it's obvious that Jerusalem is still standing, uh, not for long. In fact, by 63 AD, uh, the revolts were, were really starting to take foothold. Uh, and things were going to, and Rome had begun to crack down even more and more, uh, but it took several years before it finally got taken care of there from the Roman perspective. Um, some would say that it fits with the timing of the publication of the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Mark, unless you say Mark is first in the process. Um, so maybe Luke and Mark are both early. In the process or maybe Matthew Mark and Luke are all early in the process and maybe they were close in time I we don't know uh, and I'm not sure how I don't I have that but I'm not sure where I got that you know I had that written down and now I can't remember I don't think he's I don't think Benoit says that um, but anyway it was it was somewhere in my research that I saw that statement and I, oh well We'll put it in there, and, and now I forgot what, what it's from. Um, external evidence for an earlier date. Uh, Polycarp, who was John's disciple, the Apostle John's disciple. Polycarp, um, Justin Martyr, early leader of the church, these church fathers, uh, they alluded to Luke as the author. Uh, how the one of the questions they have is how would how would Luke know what went on because he wasn't there, not for all of it. Well, I mentioned it earlier. He he had Paul, he had Barnabas, he had Silas, he had he was in Jerusalem several times with Paul and and seemingly maybe even on his own uh, to interview people. He met the apostle the other apostles. Uh, he went to places where Paul had been and could obviously interview people who were there uh, and, and hear their account of the story where Paul may not know from his side because he wasn't you know, involved in that one over there. So um, it's not that, and if you really wanted to push it, God could have just revealed it to him. But I don't think that's primarily how it went. I think the fact that he he did his due diligence that he said he was doing, I'm going to compile it, I'm going to, these people have tried to write it, I'm going to try to put this together so that we have an account of it, because it's worth having the account. Uh, Barnabas was at Antioch, Luke was at Antioch, Luke may have been, had be, may have become a Christian at Antioch. Don't know. But or if he didn't become a Christian there, he became a Christian and came there and then got involved in the church there in Antioch. Um, so I, I don't think that's a, a, a big problem. Bridging the gap from the Gospels to the Epistles. If we just had the Gospels and then we jump into the Epistles, yeah, we would wonder, what's going on here? Why is, why is Paul writing a letter to the church at Philippi? How did a church get in Philippi? How did a church get in Ephesus? How did a church get in Thessalonica? The Corinthians? How, we're, suddenly we go from Jerusalem to, to Rome and to Greece. And how do we... That's a long ways away. Not to mention we, we, we skip over. You skip over Samaria and you skip over... Antioch, and so you, you suddenly go from here, clear over there, and, and you get whiplash in some sense, I guess. So Acts <laughs> is a book of transition. Uh, it's a book of victory. Even though at times it doesn't seem like victory, Stephen's dead, James is dead, the church is sh shoved out of Jerusalem, Paul, everywhere Paul goes, he's hassled and harassed, you know, it doesn't seem on the surface like victory, but when you look at it as a whole, it, it is a victory. It's the, you look at where the church came in 35 years. <laughs> yeah, whoa! <laughs> uh, and, and, and the idea that the church at Rome 
was established without an apostle ever getting there, at least not getting there to establish it. Peter and Paul both obviously were there at times, but nobody, no apostle went there and started that church, and yet it seemed to be a fairly strong church and a solid church. So how did that happen? Well, we read a bit, we see some of it in the book of Acts, and, and we'll talk about that. Um, I like this chart. It got cut off at the top there just a little bit. Um, I'll have to see if I can fix that in the future. Um, it could be just that TV. Yeah, and maybe on the other ones it's better. Here's a, here's a, a chart I thought was really handy. Uh, you, you get primarily Peter in the first six chapters, and then you get Peter and others for the couple of chapters, and then you get Paul for the rest of the trip. You get the church established, the church scattered, then church extended. Uh, and we'll look at those a little bit more as we go along. Uh, there's the preparation that's involved in this. There's the church being dispersed. You get Gentiles in the church. You've got that other uh, chart over there of the church foretold and born and witnessing and organized and expanding and dispersed. Um, not dispersed in, okay, let's all go. It's, it's okay, let's all get out of here. <laughs> a little bit backwards maybe, but at least they got dispersed. Um, you get the first missionary journey and then uh, the church in conference. That was an important event where because you're bringing Gentiles and Jews together and how are we going to make this work? And they, and they sent out this letter, as you know. Here's, here's what, in, if you would just do these things, don't eat blood and don't eat things sacrificed to idols. And, uh, I can't remember. And one of them was don't commit immorality, but then there's a third one there that's just more of a dietary thing that goes along. Um, and after, after a while, it's like that's a non-issue. You know, it's an issue for the transition. And the book of Acts is definitely a transition. Transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. It's instituted, but now how do you change the institution? The, the whole mindset of this is the way we've done things for centuries as Jews, and now we've got a new standard. We've got a new thing that's coming in. And so it takes time. Change takes time. Um, the church is notorious for, for being slow to change. Uh, but I don't think it's just the church. Uh, people are generally, we're slow to, yeah, you sudden, suddenly you change because you've got to sometimes, or God does something dramatic in your life, and, and boy, that's the mark of it. And, and from that day on, you're something, there's something different in your life. Uh, but as a general rule, change comes gradually. And there's some growing pains, and some, and we're going to look at some of those growing pains of taking Gentiles and bringing Samaritans in, and Gentiles and Jews, and and then John's disciples get in there, and you're trying to make this new man that God is putting together, and then we're trying to figure out how do we live with each other, how do we put up with this, how do we, what's going to be our standards, what's going to be our culture? You're establishing a new culture. Before it was Jews and Gentiles, now it's Jews, Gentiles, and the Church of God. And the Church of God is a distinct, separate group. Even though it's not based on genetics, it's based on faith, but there's a whole culture that gets connected to that, a way of living that's different from these, similar but different. And so you're, you're blending, and, and you got people that have some really bizarre ideas on both sides. From the Gentile side, they look at the Jews and say, what? You don't eat pig? What's wrong with you? And the Gentiles look and say, you eat pig? What's wrong with you? So you, those are big deals, uh, bigger deals for the Jews than for the Gentiles. So anyway, that's part of that transition that takes place here. Um, look, at, look at in Nelson's. Do you have your Nelson's book? Uh, page 351, there's a chart. Uh, in fact, there's a correction in that chart that I need to make sure that you uh, know about. It's uh, at the bottom of page 351, Peter and Paul compared. Pretty interesting little, uh, little doodad here. Uh, when we compare their ministries and their life here in the book of Acts, uh, Peter in chapter 3 heals a man who was lame from birth. The guy sitting there at the temple as he went up to prayer. 
uh, in chapter 14, Paul heals a man lame from birth. Uh, in chapter, it's supposed to be chapter 5, not chapter 3, 15 and 16. Uh, people are healed by Peter's shadow, or at least they're anticipating it. And it kind of indicates that maybe it did happen in verse, six, verse 16. Uh, and then in chapter 19, people are healed by handkerchiefs or aprons from Paul that Paul had worn. I don't know. What's that about? But they both have these kind of healings by extension that go on. Uh, in chapter 5, Peter has success, and his success is cause for Jewish jealousy. The Jewish leaders are jealous. And so success for Paul also caused Jewish jealousy in chapter 13. And it continued on, and they chased him all around Asia Minor. Uh, Peter confronts Simon, a sorcerer, in chapter 8. And Paul confronts Bar-Jesus, a sor sorcerer, in chapter 13. Uh, Peter raises Tabitha, or Dorcas, to life in chapter 9. And Paul raises Eutychus to life in chapter 20. Peter is jailed and freed miraculously by God. Angel comes and the chains fall off. James is killed and... Peter walks out. Paul is jailed and freed miraculously by God at Philippi. Interesting. Was this a purposeful thing that Peter I and mean, that Luke put together? He could have. It could have been part of his, you know, he, he, maybe he saw that, or maybe it was just the Holy Spirit was showing that together. Part of what that does is it, you know, Peter just gets left behind at some point, and Paul becomes the center of attention. So you could say it was establishing Paul in, as an apostle, but you could also say it was also validating Peter and saying, Peter and Paul, you can't say, well, I'm a Paul, I'm a Peter, although some of them did. No, they're, everything Peter did, Paul did. Everything Paul did, Peter had that same type of thing as well. Peter wrote some letters to the churches. Not as many, but he wrote letters. And, and Peter, we, we learn, goes out and, and, and travels and does missionary journeys as well. So interesting uh, chart there. The purpose of the book of Acts. Um, Jesus is still at work. I think we could say that would be a, a pretty good example. Um, 1-1, one, one, all that Jesus began to do and say, um, you'll receive power, Acts 1-8, you'll receive when the Holy Spirit has come up on you and you'll be witnesses to me. We're still telling the story of Jesus. Um, all of the rest of those, those verses there in, in, in uh, chapter 1, all the way to the end, it shows. Uh, what you'll see there is if you have a red-letter Bible, there's a lot of red letters in the book of Acts, more than you might realize or more than you might think. Sometimes it's Paul talking about Jesus speaking to him on the road, and sometimes it's he's reminiscing about it, or, you know, re recounting it to somebody. So you have the event where it happened, then you have when Paul tells the story, you get Jesus' words in red. And there's, and there's a verse in there that uh, tells us something that Jesus said that you will not find in the Gospels. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Yeah. As, and I forget how it says, as Jesus said, or as the Lord Jesus, as the, what now? As the Lord Jesus? Okay. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, as he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Kind of a little trivia thing you could throw out there. What book of the Bible do you find these words from Jesus? Most people wouldn't think, wouldn't think of Acts. They'll think of the Gospels, maybe the book of Revelation. They might think of that too. So, um, so anyway, there's a, there's a variety of references there, uh, all establishing that Jesus is, is still involved in this. This is still about him. And so the work of Jesus continues. Here is a, a map. I think I, there was Jerusalem. 
in Judea, and then he goes to the next thing, and then it circles out to Samaria. Now, I need to make a comment that, that obviously Samaria doesn't go way down into the Negev and down into the wilderness of sin. Um, Judea doesn't go down there either, but it's just a circle to show the extent of things. So Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the uttermost part of the earth, which where we end with an axe is Rome. Rome. So that's that map just to help. We're going to look at several maps as we work our way through here tonight. Um, I put these on here. These are the, the purpose, uh, witness to the resurrection. Uh, Jesus, God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Acts 2, 32. Uh, 3, 14 and 15. Uh, this Jesus God raised up, which we are all witnesses. And, and then again, um, chapter 4. Uh, verse 32 and chapter 5 verse 32 uh, with great power the apostles were giving witness so Jesus is still the center of attention here we saw that he was alive he was raised from the dead it's central to our faith it's central to our belief and our doctrine if we have no risen Savior we have no salvation if we have no risen Savior Paul says we are we should be pitied above all men because we bought into a lie. And so we, we tie that in. Um, that's what the, the apostles were sent to do. They were the ones who saw Jesus, and so they were passing that message along. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is central in here, here in this book. Uh, the one that Jesus said he would send, the one that was the promise of the Father. So who sent the Holy Spirit? the Father or the Son? And the answer is yes. And, and you've studied that in doctrine class already, so you know that they fought a good fight. Uh, well, wait a minute, it's, it's promise of the Father. Well, no, it's, I'm going to send the Spirit. And they eventually figured it out. Okay, well, it's both true. They both sent the Holy Spirit. Calling Jews and Gentiles and John the Baptist's disciples. I, I thought I stuck it back in there. I Maybe I didn't save it when I did. Uh, Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, and John the Baptist's disciples. Uh, it should be in there after uh, with the Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the, obviously, the Jews early on, that was the primary church in the first days. Uh, the Gentiles, uh, the Samaritans are in chapter 8. Uh, the Gentiles uh, with Cornelius initially. That opening the door. Remember, Peter has to get called on the carpet for that one. Uh, what do you think you're doing? Well, uh, I couldn't help it. God just did something. Oh, okay. Well, if God did it, praise the Lord. We'll, we'll rejoice in that. Uh, and then you get John the Baptist's disciples. Uh, the Jews, we, the verse 2 4 would be. Um, did I? No, I did. I'll put this one up there too. Um, the Jews in 2.4, the Gentiles in 10.44, um, the Samaritans in chapter 8, and John the Baptist's disciples in chapter 19. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Uh, this little group of John's disciples up in Ephesus, and it's, it's fairly late in the story in chapter 19 when Paul comes across them and, and um, they get incorporated into the church in a special ceremony, if you will. Um, don't know why it didn't happen before. Uh, maybe the, all the groups down below, that it was just kind of a natural transition, but if we're going years down the road and John's disciples are still John's disciples, it's kind of a significant thing to try to get them, well, these guys have already joined with us. Why don't you join with us? Well, let's, let's see if we can square this up and get it squared away. Um, there's the idea that the Holy Spirit moving by God's plan is in here. There's part of it back with this, just real quick, for the, uh, in chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit coming on the apostles um, and whoever else was in the room, it seems. But the apostles were the ones who were speaking in other languages to the people who were there, which is significant, and we'll look at that a little bit later as well. Um, and then the Samaritans come into the picture, and they send, um, do they send Peter up, I think? They send some apostles up to 
verify because Samaritans, that's where the, the deacon, uh, Phil, went up there and was telling them of the, of the gospel. And so they sent, I think, Peter and John. Is that, am I mistaken? It's in chapter 8? No, chapter... Yeah. Yeah, Peter and John got sent just to verify it, just to guarantee, yeah, these people really have become part of the church. And then you get the Gentiles, Cornelius' house, Peter's there. Uh, and then you get John's latecomers later on with Paul there. And it all revolves around the Holy Spirit. We haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit, John's disciples say. And so there's prayer for them, lays his hands on them, and there's, there's an event that takes place, a ceremony, event, whatever you want to call it, where the Holy Spirit comes. Some have a manifestation of t speaking in tongues, another language. Some don't, or at least it's not mentioned. But then you don't get, as Paul goes from place to place to place, when he goes to Corinth or when he goes to Thessalonica or when he goes to Philippi, we don't have any account of there being... doesn't mean that they didn't have received the Holy Spirit because we know from Scripture, that what the Scriptures teach us, that when we come to Christ, the way we are born again, Jesus said, is by God's Spirit. And God's Spirit comes into us and we are born again. So people are born again and they receive God's Spirit, but we don't have an ongoing account blow by blow in every community that there was this manifestation. Obviously, there were gifts. Corinth, that's the big issue in Corinth, the, the, not only the gifts, but tongues in particular. But it doesn't, it doesn't get trumpeted and talked about all the way along. So we're wondering, was this, was this an initial event for identifying a group of people saying, yes, Samaritans are a part of the church as well. Jews are a part of the church. Well, Samaritans are a part of the church. And Gentiles are a part of the church. And even John's disciples, who were Jewish or maybe not Jewish, I don't know how they were, they got included in the church. Uh, I, don't know that, I don't know that we need to you know, draw a line in the sand and fight about it, but it just seems interesting that it gets mentioned once representing each group of people, and then it doesn't get mentioned again as an event. Although we know that they received God's Spirit, but how and when that worked, it doesn't, it doesn't give us that. Um, so the Holy Spirit moving by God's plan. Uh, this is a cool one that we're going to look at a little bit later. Um, the Holy Spirit was the one who called, the one the Holy Spirit is the one who took Philip to Samaria, who sent him to Samaria. The Holy Spirit is the one who said, uh, set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. How did the Holy Spirit say that? I don't know. They were praying and fasting, and somehow they understood what God's Spirit was saying to them, that these guys need to go on a trip. And so they, they responded to that. And then you see it ongoing in the book of Acts, and we'll come back and look at that a little bit later. Spirit-directed, Spirit revealed, Spirit led, and sometimes the Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus. So um, they're moving, uh, moving by God's plan. They're speaking, the Holy Spirit is speaking through the Word, um, through the Old Testament scriptures in particular. Use, you'll, you'll see them, see these in all, in all caps. Uh, as as the disciples were being persecuted that early on when they were beaten, they came back, they rejoiced, they prayed, and, they, the, and the place was filled, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not, not another separate deal uh, as far as a baptism of the Spirit, but they were filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak the Word of God boldly. There is a strong connection between God's Spirit and God's Word. The, uh, you see it again and again and again if you, if you start looking at it. Uh, a lot of times, I don't know if you ever have had to put up with this. I had, uh, there were, there were uh, some in some churches that I've been in who would look at, well, you're, you're into the Word and I'm into the Spirit. As if they're two completely separate and opposite sides of the coin. When the reality is, is the Spirit and the Word are tightly connected. 
when, when we are filled with God's Spirit, we will speak God's Word. We will proclaim God's truth with boldness. We will have the words. We will remember the things that Jesus has taught us. So there's a strong connection that we need to make sure we see and don't buy into the idea that, well, those people over there, they're all, they're all spirit-led, and we're being led by the Word. This is more solid than that. No, it, there's not a separation, is, I think, the reality. It's an artificial separation that gets put in there. Uh, and it's the source of power uh, that comes. Uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. How could they do the things they did? Because God's power was on them, and God's Spirit was working through them to spread that gospel to the nations. Um, I just threw these on. I don't know we're going to take a whole lot of time looking at every one of these verses. Uh, the church prayed. This was what we were looking at Sunday and what we did in small groups. I don't know if anybody got to any of the verses on prayer. Um, I could have just copied these and, and put them in there. Uh, the church prayed. The church prayed. The church prayed. The church prayed not only not only on a solo basis. In fact, you know, Peter was praying on the roof, so there was a solo praying. But most often you see the church praying in mass, uh, praying together. They were gathered together to pray for Peter. James had died. Peter was in prison, going to die. They got together and prayed. And they were, they were people of great faith, weren't they? They believed that God was going to get Peter out until Rhoda came and said, Peter's at the gate. And they said, oh, no, no, it must be his angel. It wouldn't be Peter. Peter's in prison, don't you know? So that kind of puts the, a question mark about, well, did they really have faith? Did, they didn't believe it whenever they were told that their prayers were answered. Uh, they were asking for something pretty astounding when you stop and think about it. Uh, but they prayed. And so there's a whole list of accounts where they prayed. Somebody in the church, either individually or corporately, was praying. We see a geographic spread uh, of um, Acts 1-8 uh, starts at Jerusalem at Pentecost, waited Jerusalem for, till the Holy Spirit comes, and then when the Holy Spirit comes, then you'll be able to go and take it to the rest of the world. Judea and Samaria, how did the gospel get there? Through persecution. It wasn't because the church was obedient. God agitated them so they would move. Yeah, uh, stirred them up, uh, got, them, got them moving. And it says, it says that they went, as they went, wherever they went, they preached the gospel. And the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So it wasn't even the apostles. It was just regular Joe and Jane Christian who was doing this. The gospel was spreading not, not even primarily by the apostles themselves, although we won't knock them because they did do that and they went much further than maybe we can imagine at times. But the church itself was involved in spreading the gospel as they, wherever they went, which is the way Jesus describes it in go into all the world, as you are going, wherever you find yourself, be about the business of making disciples. And the church spread in Judea and Samaria through persecution. And then it went on to Antioch, and Antioch became a center for Christianity, uh, an international center in many ways, people from all over the world that were there, Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans and whomever, uh, and then from Antioch all the way to Rome, which was, obviously that's only one direction. We don't get the story east in, in Luke. We don't get the story south and across Egypt except through the Ethiopian eunuch that is heading back there. Uh, we don't get that story. We only get one direction. Again, Luke, if Luke is trying to help substantiate Christianity as a legitimate religion that should be recognized as separate from Judaism, well, here, this is where we're going. This, that's why we're going to Rome, and that's why this side of the story is what's told. Okay. Let's, uh, it's, uh, I've got five till eight. Let's take about a, a little over a five minute break. Just eight o'clock, a few minutes after eight, we'll be back here.
<laughs> oh, I've seen that one, yeah. Okay, we're ready. Back at it. We're just now starting again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I didn't lie. <laughs> it was break when I texted you. <laughs> yes. Um, missionary characteristic of the book of Acts. Uh, the, there's a presupposition of Christianity in the book. There's no, uh, there's no explanation about it. There's no because he already wrote that in the book of Luke, so he he just picks up the story where it is. Um, the impetus of this whole thing is that Jesus is alive, and that Jesus is coming back. Uh, it's not as big a deal of Jesus coming back as it is. It starts it off that way. The same Jesus you saw is coming back, and and that was their impetus. They knew that Jesus was coming back, and so we need to get the word out. We need to get as many disciples as possible, which was what rabbis were supposed to do, get as many disciples as they could. Um, Christianity without missions is impossible, is what one person has said. If, if we Christianity has, has never been designed to be sedentary, small group, us four and no more, a closed community in that regard. It became that again and again. And in, at times it becomes that in our churches. Our churches become closed off and, and we want to be pure so we keep everybody else out. And, and we aren't really interested in reaching out to them because we want to stay holy and those people will contaminate us. Uh, that's not the nature of what the church was supposed to do. It's not the nature of what the church should be. And uh, we see it here in the book of Acts. It's always this go to the next place and reach out to the, to the next group of people. And we have the storyline, but we don't, but as, we, as we'll get on into the other books, as we see some of the other books, we're going to see that, you know, there are, there are other avenues being explored by other apostles, and there are other churches being established other than the ones that we see. The ones we see aren't the only ones. There are others that are, that are being established. Um, this fragmentary account, not all the apostles' stories are told, as not all the apostles are told. Uh, there's an episodic presentation. You get, it's a kind of a mini-series, you know. Here, there's this event, and you get a trip, and so you get the individual episodes of the trip, and then they're back. And now, let's go again. Oh, then a little bit of conflict, and now we're going to do that little trip and come back. It covers about 35 years. It doesn't say it in here, I don't think. Uh, but I've got that in my notes somewhere. Because uh, if we're looking at it being written in 65, and so Jesus is crucified somewhere around 28 to 32, depending on who you, who you listen to, um, maybe as late as 34. So 30 to 35 years we're looking at. I think... Um, Berkeley, the Berkeley version of uh, the New Testament, I think he puts uh, a year and dates and stuff at the top of each chapter. I was going to get my Berkeley version out and look at that and see. Um, there's some summary statements where it just kind of, it kind of, it doesn't give you the details. It just gives you kind of a wrap up of some things that happened without going into great detail. So there's more stories. It's just like all of the Gospels, you know, the, and John said it well. He said, if I, if I were to write everything down, the world couldn't contain it. Uh, and you start throwing in what, if that's what he began there, look at what he's doing now, it's even more so. And so now you extend it out 2,000 years almost and look, look at it's around the world, perverted at times in some forms and, and reformed at other times. So um, that was the beginning. Uh, the biographical interests uh, that are here. Personal stories and testimonies abound. 100 different people, individuals, uh, many of them women, are referenced and talked about. Uh, some there's a conflict with them. Some it's their story of conversion. Uh, others, uh, uh, their opposition that, that comes in. Uh, we have Philip the evangelist. We have Paul's nephew. Uh, 
found when we were reading in Acts one time in our quiet time, uh, had this insight about how old is Paul's nephew, do you think? Did you ever, did you ever wonder uh, how old Paul's nephew? Well, in, in chapter 23, verse 19, you know, he had come and he had, heard, he had overheard the plot. These guys had taken a vow. They were going to kill Paul. And uh, they were going to appeal and get, uh, get the Romans to bring him to appear before the Sanhedrin. And they were going to kill him on the way. They were going to attack him. Even if it cost them their lives, they were going to get rid of Paul. So he comes and tells Paul, and then Paul introduces him to the guy guarding him, and they take him to the commander. And so you see that old phrase there? He says, so he took him by the hand and led him aside. Now, if, it, if he was in his 20s, you wouldn't think the, the soldier, let me take you by the hand, let's walk over here and talk you're anticipating maybe a younger child, maybe 11, 12, maybe, maybe 10, nine. It's a speculation, but there's a little clue there that seems to indicate that it could be that he was younger than maybe sometimes we might think. We have the story of Barnabas, a great uh, story, of the account of Barnabas, the information we have about him, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, and on and on and on. All kinds of characters and people that are tied around those events so that it's not just about an event or a quote a ministry thing happening over here and it's not just about oh look at this great thing that happened it's look at these people look at the lives that are changed <coughs> we have sermons and speeches there's examples of teaching there's reference to teaching without examples uh, you don't get the details of, I've often wondered, well, why didn't they just put it all out there and then we have our curriculum, right? Uh, we don't know what the curriculum was directly, we know generally. Uh, there are 24 sermons and speeches that are accounted, some of them from government leaders, many of them from believers. Um, there are, there, it's the key to the establishment of faith, the proclamation of the truth, the proclamation of the word. Uh, the, those sermons that are preached, that gives the substance to what we believe. We believe what we proclaim, and we proclaim what we believe. And so how are you going to know what to believe if, if it's not expressed, if, we, if it's not taught? Um, most of what we have as far as the sermons and speeches are probably only portions, not the whole deal. Stephen's it's probably the closest to getting the full full meal deal because it goes on forever, uh, at least not by modern standards. <laughs> but in, in from what we read in the Bible, it goes on a long ways. It has this whole recounting of the history of, of Israel. Um, you even get Festus. I found out about Festus. Um, you know, he's the guy that was eaten by worms there at Caesarea Philippi. No, Caesarea. Uh, on the ocean, on the coast, maritime they call it. Um, we were we were in the uh, amphitheater where where he was, and um, I didn't know that this was this had happened, but there's writings that tell that it did. Uh, when they were saying, "Oh, the voice of a god and not a man," uh, he was speaking. He was he was on the platform. He was on the stage of the amphitheater, and he had had a special robe made for him with gold plate. It was all gold-plated. And so he sat on this throne with his gold-plated robe just at the time that the sun was going to be coming right through the uh, upper part of the windows, of the back of the Colosseum, of the amphitheater, and it hit him. And there was this bright golden glow that came out of him as he was speaking. And they, oh, the voice of a God and not a man. He did it for, on purpose. He did it on, for effect. He knew the time it was going to be there, and he had everybody together for this speech in order to be impressive. And it cost him. And it says he was eaten by worms and died. Doesn't sound like a fun way to die. 80 geographic references. You know, if you're making up a story, you probably shouldn't use real places. 
You know, you shouldn't pretend like you need to have it be somewhere where nobody's ever going to know. You make it in another land like the Shire, you know, or Middle Earth uh, or Narnia. You make it somewhere else and then you can make anything up you want. But if you start using place names and you're saying, you know, and then they went here and then they took two days and they got there. You start putting places in place then people are going to look and say, wait a minute, that's that's not that's not right. Uh, you know, if you so there's a there's a lot of locations mentioned, and those locations have proven have proved to be very beneficial in going back and tracking and seeing what was we're good uh, seeing that what Luke wrote was true. In fact, for a long time, there were people who said, "Well, Luke, Luke wasn't accurate. He just made these places up because they don't exist. There's no record of them." Uh, there's no town by that name there now. There's not even a, you know, anything. But then they started looking, you know, archaeology goes around and they begin to dig into this place. Wait a minute. Oh, here's a place that's named that. And it's the, about the right distance from where it would be for a day's journey or however it would be, what Luke said. Oh, okay. So then they started looking at Luke to find the places. You know, Luke became their their guide map to their treasure map to say where where is this place? And Luke would tell him. So the, those geographic references, he uses the correct political terms: uh, procurator, procurator, consul, politarch, asiarch. He uses that. That's an Ephesus. That's the the official title of the leaders in Asia Minor. But when he gets to Philippi, he doesn't use that. He uses the proper terms for the leaders that are there. Um, even mentions Claudius in 1128. That's when, I think that's when the Jews got pushed out of Rome in, uh, in Acts 1128. Historical and archaeological evidence is corroborate. It, it matches. It fits. And um, so that helps lend some credibility to the story and and gives us some assurance so it's not just quote blind faith it's faith based on stuff that looks true and sounds true and shows to be true uh, there's doctrinal importance uh, the substance of the gospel is is here what must i do to be saved believe on the lord jesus christ and you'll be saved in your household there, there's a very clear presentation of the gospel in, in the midst of this uh, Jesus is seen as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Redeemer, even across the cultural boundaries. Um, used uses different phrases. Messiah would mean more to the Jews. Son of God, Redeemer. Those were would be terms that could be uh, understood in every culture. We see the Holy Spirit as the agent of Christ again and again. Uh, I, this is an interesting thought. There is no shading. Of history, he doesn't color history in order to make a point. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't fudge a little bit in order to get the point in. He just tells the story, and the, and it's there. It's just a natural part of it. It's not forced. yeah, it's not forced. He's not having to manufacture a way to get this expressed. He just tells the story, and it's there all throughout. Um, a couple of examples of, of preaching here. There's a Jewish audience that is spoken to Paul in a synagogue. Massive amounts, or not massive, a considerable amount of quoting the Old Testament. Using the Old Testament account to speak to the Jewish audience. Uh, at Athens, he's speaking to a secular audience in that regard, not a Jewish audience. Not a bit of scripture is mentioned. He mentions the truth. And he actually appeals to one of some of their writers as opposed to the biblical writers, uh, wasn't the most successful sermon he ever preached. He did have some people come and, and check it out, but for the most part, they dismissed him because they, they just dismiss everybody if they agree, disagree with them. Uh, and then in Acts 20, here's another type of message that's given. He's giving it to the Ephesian elders. And so that's a, it's a whole other focus. He's not proclaiming the good news and telling people to trust in Christ. He's calling on the church leaders now to begin to, to take that responsibility. There's going to be wolves that are savage wolves that will come in after him. You need to protect the flock. Um, so 
we see a variety. We see a different format, a different way of trying to reach whoever your audience might be here from that. Also, there's no creeds uh, inserted from a later time, uh, which also puts it earlier. You know, there, there were some creeds early on. There were some early, Paul writes to Timothy, and it seems as if there were some songs and some little statements of faith that had been picked up. Uh, and none of that kind of creeps in. There's no Christian lingo that, that has been established later that has kind of crept in uh, because there was no church to establish that yet, not, not established in each place. Um, visions and dreams. There's a chart in Nelson's, uh, page 351, that uh, gives, uh, that deals with these, these references that are here. Uh, talking about well, turn too many pages. There it is. That's the top of page 351. There's dreams at the top and then visions. And I don't think they've they've got them all. They've got uh some from the gospels and then they've got here in, in um the book of Acts. Um but it does I don't think they've got them all. But they've got they've got quite a few. There's a lot of it that happens. Uh, and I think I've got verses in there that they may not have, or maybe those are the same ones. You can, you can look at those later. It shows that there's something going on. We, we saw the idea of angels and demons and spiritual activity in the Gospels again and again. Well, in the book of Acts, you see it as well. There's demons that get cast out, and there's visions, and there's, there's angels that come and do things. Um, so you, you see that same character it's not like suddenly after jesus died then there's no more angel activity or demonic activity no it it continues on and so you see it there um here we come to this is a different um outline than what you have in benoit and what you have in nelson's uh but i thought it was worthwhile and and we'll take uh most of the rest of the time in in trying to work our way through this um first section uh, the key personality is Jesus, it ties to Luke. It has that connection there at the beginning. The event that takes place is the ascension, and the key doctrine is the, the procession or the coming of the Holy Spirit is taught. The, geograph ge the geography is just outside of Jerusalem. And the next section from 112 all the way to 8.3 is uh, the origin of the church, the church getting started and getting established and and kind of feeling its way and getting getting where it needs to be key personality is peter uh it's there there are some events of the of men versus the holy spirit um ananias and sapphira for one or two uh jewish leaders for another who are opposing god's spirit and god's work uh for example the key event or the key yeah the key event is evangelism We've got a couple of sermons preached that people are coming to Christ, and, it, and it's something that seems church was being added to daily, it says. People were coming and becoming a part of that day after day. Uh, the key doctrine is about the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came, now the Holy Spirit is there, and the Holy Spirit is working in, in and through them, and it all takes place around Jerusalem. Then we get the transition in chapter 8 through uh, chapter 11. Um, Key personalities, we have uh, Philip the deacon, uh, Peter, John, Barnabas, and Saul uh, take up this part. It's where we begin to really see some preparation for this movement, this transition. Um, Spirit-filled preachers is what we see here. And not just the apostles. You get Philip in there. You get Barnabas in there, who was not an apostle apostle, but uh, was still filled with the Spirit and proclaimed the truth. Key events, Peter at Caesarea and Saul's conversion, uh, significant in many ways. Key doctrine, the sealing by the Holy Spirit, the confirming work of God's Spirit. And, and the key geography there is at the end of chapter 9, verse 31. And the church was, was enjoying peace the, the, after Saul's conversion. Now in Judea and Samaria, Galilee and Samaria, the church was... Prospering was doing well. Everything was good. Um, I thought I had a map here. Oh, there's a map. 
in uh, in Benoit on page one thirty seven. Oh, there it is. Um, I didn't put it up here. Uh, the early spread of Christianity, it has, how it comes out of Jerusalem and down with Philip down here and then up the coast on the other side, uh, that was that map I referred to in my notes. Um, the expansion to the Gentiles, big doings here in chapter 11 uh, all the, and into chapter 12. The key pre people involved here, Barnabas and Saul and Peter and John Mark included here. He gets introduced. Um, to the to the mix, uh, the, the gospel extends to the Gentiles again, m primarily through persecution, because um, most of the church exits Jerusalem before too long. Uh, they aren't all gone yet, but many of them are are being are getting out of dodge because of the pressure that's come. Um, key event is the Antioch conversions and the fact that at Antioch they were first called Christians, little Christs. The Holy Spirit resides in the church. You see the Holy Spirit at work there. Uh, and the key geography is Antioch. We, so we move the center from Jerusalem. Uh, we've got some Judea thing going, and then we move on up. And now we're even out of the country. We're up in Antioch. The first missionary journey. You have your Benoit book, look at uh, page 130, I say 139, I want, maybe it's 134. Oh, 139, that's Paul's first journey. I think I might have a, a map here of that too. But that gives you, that gives you a up-close personal look that you may not be able to see on the slides. Um, the Holy Spirit working through Gentile church leaders, not just, I mean, Paul was a Jew, Barnabas was a Jew, uh, but not all of them were Jews. Uh, it was the first international missionary work, the Holy Spirit through missionaries. Asia Minor was the primary ge geography here. Um, they left Antioch uh, out of Syria, came to uh, Cyprus, um, Crete, Cyprus. Cyprus, um, make their tour through that island and then head up to Perga and then on up to Antioch Pisidian in Asia Minor. They make a, a loop back uh, through these towns, uh, Iconium and Lystra to Derby, and then uh, back right the way they came back to Perga and then back to Antioch. That was their first journey um, and it caused a stir. Uh, there's uh, the Jerusalem Council. What do you boys think you're doing up there in no man's land? Uh, the issue is the Holy Spirit and the law. Do you have to become Jewish in order to become a Christian? Uh, the argument was basically this from the Jewish perspective. The Jewish believers were saying, uh, yes. Uh, Jesus is the door, but Judaism is the front porch. And so in order to get in the door, you have to get up on the front porch. And after you get on the front porch, you've got to get circumcised. And you've got to keep the law. And then you can come in. Um, Peter leads in this, as does James. Not James the Apostle, because James the Apostle is dead. This is James, the brother of Jesus, leader in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, they work it coming to unity with a cultural bridge. How can we bridge our gap here and live together and worship together and serve together? We've got to work this out. And I think from, a, from the standpoint, it, there, was, there were doctrinal issues in it for sure. But I think we need to think about this on, on down the road in the church because when we look at moving into a culture, one of the things that Christian missionaries were often accused of doing was just bulldozing into a culture, forcing, uh, if you will, British culture onto a people. Let's civilize them and make them British as we make them Christian. When that really wasn't, that's really not our mandate. Uh, who was behind wanting to make them British? The, 
rulers in England. The government in England wanted these people to be British. They wanted that well, this is our territory. We want to make them British. And so we'll teach them English and we'll teach them the British ways and they'll wear, wear British clothes. And uh, so missionaries, unfortunately, many times followed the party line. And in their sincerity, yes, they wanted to bring the gospel and they did, but it, it got enculturated. It got tied into so much other stuff. Uh, there's a great story of a, of a missionary who went to um, uh, somewhere in the Asia. It wasn't China, but he went to this group in Asia. And he got kicked out of the country. The British government kicked him out of the country because he went native. Because he hiked into this village and, and dressed like them and lived in their huts and ate their food and learned their language and led them to Christ. And there was a church established. He got kicked out. And um, he came back to Canada where he was from and developed bare aspirin. He became a chemist and, and lived in Toronto, felt he was a failure. And years, years later, that church grew up and, and uh, the, the chief son came to America to learn Hebrew and Greek so that he could translate the Bible in their language and found out that the guy was still alive and went up to Toronto and met him. It's a great, I got on the movie of it, it's on a VHS tape. Uh, but that saying, we need to consider what's, what's legitimate culturally and what's Christian. And we don't necessarily need to make people Western or American or British or whatever else it is. We need to work within that culture. And I think for the most part, the, the church and missions overall, they do a much better job today than they used to. Uh, partly because of less government interference in, in many of those cases. So that's just a side note of this council in Jerusalem. It wasn't, there was a religious and a doctrinal issue there, but there was also just a cultural thing. How are we going to live together? Uh, the second missionary journey, uh, chapters 15 into 18. Again, a conflict spread the gospel. Paul, Barnabas had a falling out over John Mark. So Barnabas takes John Mark, heads to Cyprus. And that's where he's from, and that's where they go. Don't know where they went beyond that. They very well likely did go do some other things other than just go home. Uh, Paul headed north and went through his hometown, uh, heading, heading out. Um, Spirit of Jesus forbids and directs as, as they work their way, as they go on past up. Uh, we want to go down to Asia Minor. Spirit of Jesus said, no, oh, let's go up to Pontius and, and Cappadocia. No, 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 the Spirit wouldn't let them. Oh, so they just kept walking until they ran out of land and had to stop at Troas and, and eventually got the call to go across from Asia into Europe. Uh, here's some maps. Here's the, the Antioch to Derby Iconium through where they had been before, and then eventually... Right straight up to Troas. You know, a straight line in, in a real sense didn't go south where they, they tried to go south. They tried to go north, but that wasn't the Spirit's plan. Was the Holy Spirit planning on doing something in the south and in the north? Yeah, yeah. Peter had connections with Cappadocia and Pontius and up in that area. So, see, you don't have to take care of everybody. You just have to do what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. And you can see that there are other places that that need the gospel, but maybe God's not calling you to that. You can pray if you can't go. Um, and then eventually it came down to Ephesus. Here's, here's the other, some other places, the Philippi, Thessalonica. I don't know how many things they, the Berea, down to Athens. Uh, and then what? There we go. I'm not sure how many clicks I have to put to make these maps do all their, their thing. Eventually they made it back to Caesarea. And that was when Paul was getting ready to get in trouble, too. Uh, went up to the church to report. Third missionary journey. Um, the, in that, in that uh, second missionary journey, he spent 18 months at Corinth. So this was a long one. The first one was relatively short. The second one was much longer. Um, the third journey, uh, discipleship and missions. Uh, you don't see nearly as much new ground broken as going back over and strengthening the churches that takes place. Um, 
you get you get uh, the John the Baptist disciples in this trip at Ephesus. Uh, during this trip is when he's writing letters. Some of the letters that he wrote was during this trip. Yes, John. They were. Yeah, I don't know. They were John the John the Baptist disciples in Ephesus. Yeah. Part of the Jewish culture, there, you know, the Jews lived everywhere, and so there were Jews that lived there, and they found this group that was hold, they were holding true, um, and they just didn't know, the, didn't have the whole story. He spent two years at Ephesus during this trip, um, and like I said, he wrote many of the letters during this time. There, there was the prominence of teaching and discipling as opposed to evangelism. You know, what you see in the first and second to a degree, you see a, a big response to the gospel in churches, you know, many people coming to Christ. But then the third trip, you don't see that. It's not, it's not the same thing. You know, the, Paul shows up and he's not really there to try to do the work of evangelism. He's there to try to strengthen the churches because the church already exists. It doesn't mean that people aren't coming to Christ. It just means that it's not like it was at the first time in. And I think that there's a, you know, they say one of the reasons that um, they say the best way to, to reach people is with a church plant because brand new churches tend to have this initial surge of people coming to Christ. Sometimes their growth is primarily just moving sheep around. Uh, but but there's, a, there's something about you start a new church and there's some excitement and you get some new people. And, and a good percentage of those people are brand new Christians. And that's, that's a good thing and that's the right thing. But you can't, it doesn't sustain for some reason. Don't know if it's us or if it's just the nature of the way things are. But, but what's the church's primary job is making disciples. And the church as a whole in our connection with each other is to strengthen, encourage, and build up one another. And then our responsibility individually is to be out reaching the people around us. So it's to be multiplied in that way. Um, we don't see a big response mentioned in this third trip at all. A couple of maps uh, from Syria, from Antioch in Syria to Ephesus, and then back over to visit the churches in Greece. Oh, why? And then back to Caesarea. Map, map. His imprisonment, two imprisonments that Paul had, uh, two years each at Caesarea while he was waiting to go to Rome, and then at Rome, <laughs> uh, and then he got out. We'll look at that later in, in, in the prison epistles and, and afterwards. Then he got out, and then he got arrested again eventually, but it's not recorded in Acts, but these are recorded here. Uh, during this time was when he wrote more of the epistles, or the re not all of the rest of them, but most of the rest of them. Um, there's a possibility there could be a fourth missionary journey. And Benoit has a map on page 143 that, that might refer to that. Uh, there's his, his, his defense of the gospel before uh, at the temple, before the church council, uh, before government leaders, uh, two times at Caesarea. He gives the defense of the gospel to the sailors as they're sailing to Rome. Uh, presents the truth there. Uh, he evangelized his two governors and at least one Herod. I think there might be two Herods there because um, one of them's not called Herod, but he was a Herod. He was Herod was like a pharaoh. It was it became it became a, a name, a family name that they used to describe the leader. Uh, the officials at Malta, uh, where he got bit, he witnessed to them. He evangelized them as well. Um, have some references there in in Philippians. Um, Oh, it had to do with uh, while he was in prison, while he was chained up, because he wrote to, to the Philippi while he was in prison. And he, he said, the household of Caesar sends you greetings. So there were believers in Caesar's household. Uh, and partly perhaps because Paul was in prison there and had opportunity, the rotation of guards seemed to be a good, he can't go to them, so the Lord brings them to them. That's one of the things we, uh, we got to consider. You know, if you can't go somewhere and the Lord brings somebody like that in your life, well, wait a minute, you're, well, let me, <laughs> maybe this is an assignment, maybe for me to, to share. Uh, so here's that map of this journey to Rome. 
and uh, I think all of the uh, the wanderings around there with the storm and getting shipwrecked and eventually getting on that little island down there um, and then making it to Italy. Uh, we, we end here with Acts 28, 30, and 31. He stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Here he is in Rome. There's a church there already, a solid church from what we can gather. And he's there in prison. And even though he's in prison, well, he's in his own house, but he's in house arrest. And he's got freedom for people to come and go. The Lord had opened that opportunity. He had wanted to get to Rome, and he did. Uh, waiting, he waited two years to try to get a hearing, and then it got kicked out. Okay, yeah, you didn't do anything, so we'll let you go. And then they rearrested him later and killed him. A um, couple of quick thoughts. Uh, an emphasis today on you know, numbers in evangelism. It's not just today. Today is a long, is a long period of time because I grew up with that as, as the key. Um, I can remember one of my youth leaders. Um, I, I grew up in a church where I knew how to get saved because we, we had a gospel message every Sunday morning. And an invitation, extended invitation. Let's sing another verse. Uh, and then Sunday night at church, we would have another gospel message. It didn't matter what was being preached. It was going to be a gospel message. It, you know, it was going to be tied in there at the end. So the gospel got preached Sunday night with an ex another extended invitation. And then Wednesday night, we would come for prayer meeting, which really the deacons are the only ones that prayed. We had church, and then they prayed after church. Uh, and it was another gospel presentation with an extended invitation. I knew how to get saved. Uh, my youth leader was very evangelistic, and I bought into that and went, went with it as well. Um, years later, one of, uh, one of my friends who was part of our youth group it ran into him, and he was kind of grieved because he said the only thing when he was talking with him, the only thing he was talking about was it was like he had notches in his gun belt. You know, oh, yeah, I saved this guy, and I got this guy saved, and I... You know, it was counting the numbers of people that he had won to Christ. Praise the Lord. I, that's a great thing. But when, when our focus is kind of on us about look at what I did and look at how I did this for them, that, that's, I, it kind of misses the point, I think. Uh, so it's not a new phenomena, but it's an ongoing phenomenon. It's a, it's a human nature thing. Bigger is better, especially in the West, uh, in the U.S. and such. Um, Emphasis on numbers uh, and church membership and evangelism. How can it be assessed in light of the book of Acts? Well, in the book of Acts, you see this huge number of people coming to Christ the first, first days, the first weeks. And then day after day, the church, the Holy Spirit was adding to the church those who were being saved. So it's like an ongoing flood that comes in. Paul goes on these journeys, you know, and boom, well, there's, it seems as if, the whole town turns, or at least enough for people to say, these people are turning everything upside down. we got to do something. Okay, that's that first initial wave through. And then when it comes back through, you don't have that account. And you don't have that emphasis. You have Paul writing letters and trying to strengthen the church and, and help the church be solid, because now it's the church's job to do that job within the community, to live the life there and begin to do. I, I don't know that there's easy answers or clear answers, but I think when we look at the book of Acts, if we only look at the first section, then we say, oh, that's what we should be doing. We should be seeing thousands of people coming to Christ. Well, you're, you're entering a, a, a field that has not been harvested, that people, are, people have not heard the gospel. People are, this is brand new to them. Their hearts are hungry. They're ready to come. After a while, they've heard the message. They've grown up with the message. and It's a different story. Uh, just some issues to think about. Uh, and some principles for doing ministry that we can take from the book of Acts. Um, I, I think there are probably some to, to think about. As you, I don't have a list compiled here. Uh, but something for you to think about of, of the strategy. Um, I, and I think one of the primary things is, where is God calling you? Where is God putting you? Uh, people got moved, and, and we believe, Paul even said it in Acts 17, he says, God
God ordains the times of our lives, the boundaries of our habitation, so that we'll seek him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. And I think it relates to us as well. Even though we're, we know Christ, he still wants us to know him more, and he wants us to make him known. And so wherever it is that he puts us, and, and there may be a time when we, there's this kind of unrest and we, you know, what am I doing here? You know, and, and the Lord moves us somewhere else, either by that, that discontent or a very clear call or loss of a job or sickness that you got to go somewhere else because of that. I've, that's happened to a lot of people where they couldn't, my, Mr. Douglas, one of my favorite teachers, couldn't serve in the Philippines anymore, or he served in China and he went to the Philippines when they got kicked out of China. Couldn't serve in the Philippines, it was too humid and too wet. So he, the doctor said, Arizona or Alberta? So he came to Alberta and started teaching at Prairie. So, you know, how did God get in there? Well, his health was part of that. Wherever God's spirit is going to lead us, I think would be one of the primary things we need to look at. We need to th realize that wherever I am, I'm here by God's design. And every once in a while, you know, I can be pretty comfortable. And I just need to say, okay, step back a minute. Lord, it, Am I, am I doing what you want me to do? Am I doing it where you want me to do it? Not that I'm discontent and want to move and I'm trying to move up the ladder per se. I'm just saying, Lord, I want to make sure that I'm not just doing things out of routine because it's comfortable. I want to do these things because... And, and the Lord has done that in my life a couple of times. A couple of times he's moved me. Well, four times he's moved me. A uh, couple of times he didn't move me. But it was a confirmation that I was where I was was supposed to be and I was doing what I was supposed to do. So that's just one of the side thoughts that I had in connection with that. Some key verses. Um, Acts 1.8, the scope of our witness, not, not consecutive, but ongoing. It's not like get all Jerusalem saved and then get out to Judea. And then once you get Judea saved, then move on to Samaria. No, it happened all at once. It was just going there and that was the idea. Wherever you're going, your, your end is the end, <laughs> to the end of the age and to the end of the world. Uh, Acts 4.19, the idea of who should we obey? Should we obey God or man? The, the apostles have to deal with that. Well, we have to obey God. Um, Acts, 15, Acts 16 and Acts 17, these last, these last two here. The Lord of the harvest and God's sovereign love. We, I, I mentioned earlier, they had come across Asia Minor and they were wanting to go south. Ephesus. You know, all those places, all those seven churches that are written in Revelation are down in that area. And God wasn't sending Paul down there. And up to Cappadocia and go up that way. No, Lord wasn't sending him there. He sent him to Troas and then eventually got that. I don't know how long they were at Troas before the vision in the night, the dream. A man came saying, come over and help us. And so they go over to Philippi. And who do they find in Philippi? They find Lydia. They, they, they get to town. They had a vision of a man, right? And so they get to town, and they, they hear that there's a prayer meeting down by the river. Some think it might have actually been like a synagogue, an informal synagogue, but a place for Jews to gather as a synagogue. So he heads down there. They go find the place, and what did they discover? A group of women. Can women make up a, a synagogue? Yes, they can. They can do, if you don't, it, they could be part of the group of 10 or they can be the whole 10 or however that works out. She was a wealthy woman. She had money to help do these things and provide what needed to be provided. Lydia was a God-fearing Gentile. She had hung out with Jews and so she wanted to know about this God and so she was down there praying, seeking after God. Paul shows up, shares the gospel with her, she becomes a believer. Come to my house if I have found favor, and if I, you think I'm honest in this, and let me help. And so she becomes a supporter of Paul and, and helps the early church get started in Philippi. Where was Lydia from? She was a seller of purple, and she was from the city of Thyatira. Where is Thyatira? Asia Minor, right down by Ephesus. Part of the seven churches down there. She wasn't, she wasn't home. She was seeking after God. She was a businesswoman who wasn't home. She was in Philippi doing business. How long? I don't know. 
And so Paul wanting to go south, that would be a good thing. But the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. We got some, I got somebody that you need to meet. And even though she lives in Thyatira, even though she's from there, she's not there right now. She's over in Philippi. So just keep moving along. I've got an appointment for you. To me, that shows God's great love. God has put eternity in the hearts of men. There's something in us that we know there's more. We, we've got to have something to believe in. And, and when we come with the truth and when we come with the gospel, yeah, there'll be people that reject it and don't want to hear it. But the truth is, it, God put that eternity in their hearts. And there will be a time when we share that message with them and it'll ring true. It'll grab hold. And especially if they're beginning to seek. If they're looking for something, it, we should at least speak up you know, to be able to tell that. And to see how God would move his missionary, his servant, Paul and his troop. No, no, no not, not Asia Minor, because there's a gal from Asia Minor who's over in Philippi, and you need to go see her. To me, that's just such a, an astounding thing that God would do, and that God has done that for all of us. It may not be quite as dramatic, or our story may not be quite as dramatic, mainly because we don't know the whole story of how that person came to Christ, and then that person eventually was the one who led me to Christ or helped me understand, or they prayed for me, or they were part of the process of telling. You know, there's a, there's a chain that goes through here, and that's all God's working. And we see it here in the book of Acts, and I think we see it in our lives today. And we get to be a part Jesus is not done working. What he began to do in the Gospels, he continued through in the book of Acts, and then he's done, right? No, no, he's not done. It ain't over. It ain't over. It's still going on. So we get to be a part of that. We get to be... Uh, never mind. We'll leave it there. We get to be a part of that and make disciples. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that people were faithful in praying and in loving and in living and in proclaiming the truth. So much so that the gospel came to Oklahoma. And the gospel came to Oklahoma City. And the gospel came to Dell City. And even though I lived in Dell City, I was, down in, I was down in Texas. And there you had servants who loved me and cared for me as an eight-year-old and, and taught me the truth and shared that good news and prayed with me that I would receive Jesus Christ. And then you sent me back to Oklahoma. And then, Lord, you've sent me even to hear this day that I might share with others. Lord, may we see that we are part of the continuing acts, the works of Jesus Christ through the apostles and through the whole, by the Holy Spirit and through us as well, that we would share that good news with those around us for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.